Welcome to an introduction to parameter estimation. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Today we'll introduce a major application of probability distributions, parameter estimation. Parameter estimation is a technique that can be used to directly measure data to compute an estimated value for one or more physical parameters that are difficult or even impossible to measure directly themselves. All of the probability distributions we've looked at so far depend on both random variables, x1, x2, and so on, and parameters, theta1, theta2, and so on. It's often the case that parameter values for a specific scenario might be unknown to us in advance. For example, we might not know the size of a population. We might not know the probability of success in a Bernoulli trial. We might not know a growth rate. We might not know a population mean or variance. If any of these parameters belong to a probability distribution, we might try measuring values of the random variable or random variables of the distribution and attempt to deduce or estimate reasonable values for the unknown parameters based upon this data. This is known as the parameter estimation problem, and we will investigate two methods that can be used to address it. First is the method of moments and the second is maximum likelihood estimation. We'll begin by exploring the method of moments, which in many ways is the more interpretable of the two parameter estimation techniques that we'll look at. And then later on, we'll follow up with the maximum likelihood estimation method, which in many ways is much more flexible, even though it's, it's a little harder to interpret at first. So suppose we've made a number of measurements, d is equal to x1, x2, x3, all the way up through xn, of some random variable x. We believe that random variable is distributed according to the probability mass function, f, which depends on parameters theta1, theta2, theta3, and so on, and then the random variable x. We'll consider the first raw sample moment of our data set, and this is just the sample mean. In this context, we'll refer to it as capital M sub 1, and it really is just the sample mean. It's the sum of our measurements in the set D divided by the total number of measurements that are there, N in this case. The second central sample moment is just a, another term for the variance, and we define it in the usual way. We, we refer to it as capital M sub 2, and it is the mean of the squares of the deviations between each data point in D and the sample mean of D. And then finally, we'll consider the kth standardized central moments. And these are just higher order central moments. They're defined like the variance, except they involve higher and higher powers. So capital M sub K is the mean of the kth power of the deviations of each data point from the sample mean. And then we refer to these as being standardized because we are comparing them to the standard deviation. We're dividing them by the standard deviation raised to that same power of k. Now the third and fourth standardized central sample moments are quantities that we've actually seen before. They are just the empirical skewness and kurtosis of, of our data set. Now knowing these four moments, and how to compute them is going to be enough for our purposes. But in general, with the method of moments, you could imagine relying upon more than just those first four moments. Now, what we're going to do with them is open up an approach for estimating the parameters of our distribution. Well, we're going to define the method of moments now. And in a nutshell, it involves comparing the empirical moments taken from a data set to the theoretical moments, to the corresponding theoretical moments of the probability distribution that we believe describes the variation within that data set. So suppose you have a sample of observations, d equals x1, x2, up through xn, that you believe to be distributed according to the distribution f of theta1, theta2, up through theta j, and then the random variable x. The j parameters, theta1 through theta j, are unknown. We're going to compute and sequence the moments m1 through mj from our data. Then we're going to compute 
several mathematical expectations, and these mathematical expectations are the corresponding theoretical moments of our probability distribution. So we're going to calculate the theoretical mean, the theoretical variance, and then theoretical standardized moments of order two and higher as far as we need to go so that we've got just as many theoretical moments as we do empirical moments and then of course as we do unknown parameters. In general each of these theoretical moments will be symbolic expressions that depend on some or in some cases even all of the parameters of f. Once you've performed these computations, you're going to write down the so-called moment equations. And you're going to write down as many of them as you have unknown parameters within your distribution. So we would start by writing down the formula for the theoretical mean and setting that equal to the empirical mean that you computed from data. And you're going to do the same thing for the theoretical and empirical variance, and then the same thing perhaps for the theoretical and empirical skewness. Perhaps even a formula for the empirical and theoretical kurtosis, even higher order standardized moments than that. In any case, once you've written down as many of these moment equations that you need, corresponding to the number of unknown parameters in your distribution, you're going to remember that the theoretical formulas for the moments of the distribution all depend on some or all of the unknown parameters. So in principle, you should have a system of k equations for your k unknown parameters. And you're going to use whatever techniques are necessary to solve those equations for the values of the unknown parameters. So that's the method of moments in a nutshell, and it might seem like it's a little bit algebraically complicated, and perhaps it is for some distributions. But here's the thing, for the, for the distributions that we're going to work with, we will be able to set up and solve the moment equations once in order to obtain a symbolic formula that all we have to do is compute different descriptive statistics from our data set and plug the results of those descriptive statistics into this formula that we found once and remembered. So in practice, for the distributions that we're going to be interested in for the time being, the method of moments is a pretty simple and tractable approach to parameter estimation. We'll look at some examples of how that works in a little while. However, before we get there, we'll also need to introduce our competing technique for parameter estimation, maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to introduce maximum likelihood estimation for probability distributions that depend only on one unknown parameter. However, just understand that maximum likelihood estimation can readily be generalized to probability distributions that depend on many parameters, not just one. So suppose f of theta and x is a probability distribution, either a probability mass function that's discrete or a probability density function that's continuous. It depends on an unknown parameter theta and the random variable x. Now suppose that multiple independent observations are made of values of the random variable x, and we store those in the list d equal to x1, x2, all the way up through xn. Now, Ronald Fisher defined the likelihood function for this data set to be really what just boils down to a joint probability distribution of our entire set of observations that are independent of the random variable x. And so capital F of theta and x1 through xn is just going to be equal to the product of the individual probability distribution applied to x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn. So it's going to be the product of those individual distributions. So this, this function does represent the joint probability that we will make the different independent observations of the values of x that appear in our data set D, assuming that theta is the correct parameter for the population. Now that likelihood function probably looks complicated, but it actually depends only on one variable, theta. This is because all of the values for our data, x1, x2, up through xn, are already known. We've, we've measured them. So Fisher observed that the likelihood function should take on its maximum value with respect to theta 
when theta is the value that is the most compatible with the data that we've observed. So if you imagine sweeping theta over its possible values, once you start getting in the neighborhood of the value that's the most compatible with the data that we've collected, the likelihood function should reach a maximum. So with this in mind, the essence of maximum likelihood estimation is to choose values for the unknown parameters that can cause the likelihood function to achieve its maximum value. So what we're looking at in this illustration is a conceptual representation of maximum likelihood estimation. It's a graph of a likelihood function applied to some data set of random variable observations that are assumed to have been drawn from some probability distribution that involves a unknown parameter theta. And the graph itself is plotted with respect to theta, so this is a function of theta. And we can see that it obtains a single peak a little bit above 0 0.4, a little bit above the value of theta equal to 0 0.4. So we take that value to be the maximum of the likelihood function, which we in turn use as our estimate for the true value of theta. Now you certainly could conduct maximum likelihood estimation completely graphically, like what we saw in the previous figure. You could form your likelihood function, use mathematical software to graph it over all possible parameter values, and then just seek visually to find the parameter values that correspond to the peak on the graph. And those become your, um, your estimates for your unknown parameter and unknown parameters if there's more than one. There's other ways of going about this, though. So when theta is a discrete parameter, loc locating the maximum likelihood estimate involves just searching through all possible values of theta in order to find the values that correspond to the maximum of, of f. And there's certainly mathematical algorithms out there that are reasonably efficient for performing searches like that. When theta is a continuous parameter, the job's going to require some calculus if you're looking to do this without a, you know, a graphical assistance. And in particular, in those cases, what we would be using is something called the first and second derivative tests to locate the maximum of the likelihood function. Now, this doesn't really mean that you have to have a strong command of calculus in order to use maximum likelihood estimation in practice. In many cases, statistical software packages have a built-in maximum likelihood estimation tool that can be applied to data that you believe to be distributed according to some probability distribution, and they will use numerical approximation techniques to find the correct estimate for your unknown parameter to a high degree of accuracy. And so if all you care about is getting a correct answer, a correct estimate for some unknown parameter, you can certainly make use of those built-in techniques in mathematical software. It's just that having the command of calculus can help you have a better understanding of what's actually going on. Another thing that that strong command of calculus will buy you is, in some cases, an ability to derive exact formulas for what the maximum likelihood estimator is for a given probability distribution. So these would be formulas that you would plug descriptive statistics about a data set into, such as a mean, a standard deviation, and so on, in order to obtain the estimated value of an unknown parameter. These are just like the formulas that we would eventually derive using the method of moments. In fact, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, maximum likelihood estimation and the method of moments both produce the identical estimation formula for unknown parameters of selected probability distributions. And we'll see that that's actually the case for many of the distributions that we work with. Now in just a little bit, we'll finally get into some examples where we actually compute parameter estimates for unknown parameters of probability distributions by making use of descriptive statistics that we've computed from our data. But before we can get there, we're going to introduce some ideas that go behind evaluating 
parameter estimates and what makes a good parameter estimate. Ronald Fisher advocated for the following three criteria of a good estimate. So we're going to illustrate that if theta star is an estimate for some unknown parameter theta of a distribution, and then we compute it in terms of a set of n observations of data, x1, x2, up through xn. Fisher's first criterion was that an estimate should be consistent. And this means that the probability approaches 1, that the estimate theta star becomes arbitrarily close to the true value of the parameter theta as the number of observations goes to infinity. In other words, that is for any value of c that's greater than 0, no matter how small, the limit as n approaches infinity of the probability that the distance between the estimate and the true value of theta is less than c equals 1. Well, that's a very precise but also very abstract way of saying that as we increase the size of our data set, we should expect that our estimate is going to approach the correct value. Fisher's second criterion is that an estimate should be unbiased. And what this means is that if many estimates are repeatedly computed from comparable sets of observations, then their average will tend towards the correct value of the unknown parameter theta. In other words, the mathematical expectation of a whole set of parameter estimates should be the correct value. And what this means in practice is that we don't expect to have a good parameter estimation technique consistently produce estimates that are lower than the true value or consistently produce values that are higher than the true value. In those cases, we would say that that estimator was biased rather than unbiased. And finally, Fisher's third criterion is that an estimator should be efficient. And I'm only going to go into what this means loosely, but what it means is that if the estimator theta star is already unbiased, then what we would want to see is that the variance in the distribution of all possible values for the estimate should be as small as possible. So we're not expecting a lot of noise in the range of estimated values that we observe if we were to repeatedly compute estimate after estimate after estimate from comparable data sets but using the same technique. We're in a position now where we're going to derive parameter estimation formulas for the majority of the probability distributions that we've been using the most frequently. And we're going to use the method of moments as a tool for deriving these parameter estimation formulas. But as I mentioned earlier, these formulas are going to be compatible with what would come out of maximum likelihood estimation as well. So for at least the distributions that we're going to be working with, method of moments and maximum likelihood estimation yield pretty interchangeable results. We're going to begin with the binomial distribution. Let d equal x1, x2, all the way up through xn be a sample of n independent observations of the binomially distributed random variable x. Then, given that b of n, p, and x is the binomial distribution, p star equal the mean of x divided by n is the method of moments estimator for the unknown parameter p. Here, x bar represents the sample mean of our data set d. We can prove that this is the correct method of moments estimator formula. To arrive at the method of moments estimator for p, we need only set up and solve the first moment equation. And to do this, what we need to do is know the first raw moment of the binomial distribution. And this is something that we learned when we introduced the binomial distribution. The first theoretical raw moment is just the theoretical mean, and that's equal to n times p. Now to see how this helps us estimate p, we suppose that we've collected n measurements from our sample space, d equals x1, x2, up through xn. All we need to do with it is compute our first raw moment of the data, and that's the mean of the data, x bar. 
our first moment equation is x bar equals mu. Now, since we know that mu equals n times p, we may rewrite that as x bar equals n times p. All we need to do at that point is recognize that this moment equation depends only on one unknown value, p. x bar and n are known, so all we need to do is solve this equation for p. If we do that, we'll see that p equals x bar over n, and that brings us to our method of moments estimator, p star. So now that we've proved that formula, we own it and we can use it freely anytime we need to estimate an unknown p parameter of the binomial distribution. To see how that would work in practice, let's consider an example. Suppose we observe a gambler play a game 20 times in any one sitting. The gambler plays a sequence of 20 games during six consecutive sessions. In each of these sessions, he wins a total of 12, 11, 9, 8, 10, and 10 times. This is his data set. We believe his chances of winning any one game are independent of the other games he has played or will play, so we are justified in modeling his chances of winning x out of 20 games with the binomial distribution b of 20 comma p comma x. The trouble is, is we don't know a value for p, so we'd like to estimate it. We're going to use the method of moments to do that, so we'll compute our first sample moment of our data, which is just the mean of our data. We sum up our values and divide by 6 and find that it's 60 over 6 or 10. So that's our sample mean. The first moment equation then tells us that NP equals X bar, and we know that X bar is 10. Therefore, we can solve that for P equals 10 over N. Now we know that the gambler plays n equals 20 games in any one session. Therefore, our estimate for p resulting from the method of moments is just p equals 10 over 20, or 0 0.5, or 1 half if you prefer. So that's our estimate. Another distribution that uses p, the probability of obtaining a preferred outcome in a Bernoulli trial, is the geometric distribution. So we can use it to estimate that parameter as well. And the following theorem describes how that works. We'll let d equal x1 through xn be a random sample of n independent observations of the geometrically distributed random variable x, with probability mass function g of p and x equal 1 minus p to the x minus 1 times p. The method of moments estimator and maximum likelihood estimator for p is p star equals 1 over x bar. Now if we use the alternative form for the geometric distribution, g0 of p and x equal 1 minus p to the x times p, it also has a maximum likelihood and method of moments estimator for p star, and that's just 1 over x bar plus 1. And to prove these estimators, we'll really consider only the first form of the geometric distribution because the proof for the second form is very similar. So we're going to let g of p and x be the probability mass function. In order to estimate p using the method of moments, we would need to know the first raw moment of the geometric distribution. And this is that the theoretical mean of the geometric distribution is just 1 over p. Mu equals 1 over p. So we set up and solve the first moment equation, mu equals x bar, rewrite it as 1 over p equals x bar, and then simply solve for p to obtain p equals 1 over x bar. Now, as I've said, if g sub 0 of p and x is the probability mass function, we need only recall that the mean of this distribution is mu equals 1 minus p over p. And then if we apply a similar algebraic argument, we will find that the estimator is 1 over x bar plus 1. This proof establishes the method of moments estimators for the p parameter of our geometric distributions. If we wanted to establish the maximum likelihood estimators and see that they are the same, we would need to follow a 
argument that relies upon some calculus, some differential calculus. And that argument is available in the appendix of our text, but we're not going to go into it here. Suffice it to say that the two estimates will be the same. And now we'll illustrate the geometric distribution parameter estimation by an example. Suppose you're interested in determining the probability of winning an extremely challenging game of chance. A way to do this would be to observe many different people play the game successively. We're going to record the number of tries it takes for each person to win the game for the first time. And that data set is going to maybe look something like D equals 6,055, 4,101, 723, 5,706, 3,187, and then 14,910. And what that represents is that the first person started playing the game and did not win until their 6,055th attempt. The second person failed to win until their 4,101st attempt, and then so on. That's our sample. Now, if we're going to use the method of moments, we would need to compute the first raw sample moment of our data. That's the mean. So I sum those numbers up and divide by 6. And I get a mean of 34,682 divided by 6. Then we would set that mean to the theoretical mean formula for the geometric distribution to obtain 1 over p equals 34,682 divided by 6. Then all we need to do is rearrange that formula so that we solve it for p. We obtain a value of p equals 6 over 34,682, which to a decimal approximation is 1.73 times 10 to the negative 4. So we conclude that the probability of winning the game on any given play is approximately 1.73 times 10 to the negative 4. This is a low probability, and it's really what we mean by this game of chance being challenging. Next, we can look at an example of the Poisson distribution. Let D equal x1, x2, all the way up through xn be a random sample of independent observations of a variable x that is distributed according to the Poisson probability mass function. P of lambda and x equal to lambda to the x times e to the negative lambda divided by x factorial. The method of moments estimator and the maximum likelihood estimator for lambda is given by lambda star is simply equal to the mean of our random sample. In order to prove that formula, we need to know only the first moment or the mean of the Poisson distribution, the theoretical mean. And if we recall, the theoretical mean of the Poisson distribution is just lambda itself, mu equals lambda. So next, we're going to write down the first moment equation. So we equate the theoretical mean to the empirical sample mean, mu equals x bar. And since mu equals lambda, that tells us our estimate without any need for using algebra. It tells us that lambda equals x bar. So that is our method of moments estimator for the lambda parameter of the Poisson distribution. And it turns out, even though we won't prove it here directly, the proof is going to be available in our appendix, that this is also the maximum likelihood estimator. To see how parameter estimation works with the Poisson distribution in practice, we can look at an example. And in this example, five identical populations of 150 animals are being studied. Researchers hope to estimate the yearly reproductive rate for this species. They observe that in the first year, the five populations generate 80, 92, 87, 95, and 97 offspring. Treating these values as observations of the random variable x, the researchers estimate that the average birth rate is the sum of those values divided by 5, the number of populations that we're studying. And that results in 90.2 animals per year. That becomes our method of moments estimate for the unknown parameter lambda. Well, now we'll examine how to apply parameter estimation to the last of the four discrete distributions that we've been studying, and that's the hypergeometric distribution. On the surface, the hypergeometric distribution should seem like a good tool for estimating population size because total population size is one of its parameters. 
We'll establish the method of moments estimate for n, the total population size, in the following theorem. Let d equal x1, x2, all the way up through xm be a random sample of m independent observations of the hypergeometrically distributed random variable x with probability mass function h of n, k, lowercase n, and x equal to the hypergeometric probability mass function. The method of moments estimator for capital N, or the total population size, is n star equals lowercase n, or the sample size, times capital K, the size of the preferred population, divided by the mean of x, or the mean of the data set. To prove that this is true, we need to recall that the theoretical mean of the hypergeometric distribution is given by mu equals lowercase n, or the sample size, times capital K, or the size of the preferred population, divided by capital N, the size of the total population. We can develop a method of moments estimator for the total population size capital N by setting up and solving the first moment equation, which is just obtained by equating the theoretical mean to the empirical mean of our data set. This results in the equation lowercase n times capital K divided by capital N equals x bar. If we rearrange that equation and solve it for the total population size capital N, we obtain the method of moments estimator n star equals lowercase n times capital K divided by x bar. Unfortunately, this estimate also depends on the size of the preferred population capital K. This parameter is often unknown as well. While we could attempt to estimate it by introducing the second moment equation, the process of estimating multiple parameters at once can be a more involved process than estimating just a single parameter. At the very least, it tends to require much more data to achieve reasonably accurate estimates. However, in the case of the hypergeometric distribution, if all you care about is estimating the total population size, a technique known as mark and recapture allows you to create your own artificial preferred category with a precisely known value for k. This allows you, in turn, to focus on estimating n alone. I'll now outline the basic steps of the technique. First, you'll capture a group from the population and mark each member of this group. If this population is made up of animals, typical marking methods include ear tags, tattoos, radio collars, clipped fins, etc. You'll count the size of this group and label that size as capital K. This group will serve as your artificial preferred category. You'll want to release them back into the general population. Note, K should be large enough that when you collect future samples, the sample size lowercase n will be smaller than k. After enough time has passed to allow the marked members of the population to redistribute themselves into their environment, but not so long that it's likely that new members are born to the population, existing members die, or members just migrate in or out of the population. What you'll want to do at that point is capture a new sample of size lowercase n. Count the number x in the sample that belongs to the artificial preferred category that you created. Release the sample back to the population. Next, let the sample redistribute itself back among the population and repeat the previous step as many times as is feasible. Often time, financial resources, or environmental factors will limit the number of repeats that are possible. If d equals x1, x2, and all the way up through xj are the numbers of members of the preferred category found in each sample you've collected, this data may be used with the method of moments, or maximum likelihood estimation, to estimate n. Now I'll illustrate how mark and recapture works, together with the method of moments and the hypergeometric distribution in order to estimate the total population size parameter, capital N, from data. An ecologist intends to estimate a moose population that resides in northern Maine. She captures, tags, and releases k equal 150 members of the moose population and then lets them settle back into the herd. Then she captures five samples of lowercase n equal 40 moose each and observes that there are 5, 0, 4, 
two, and one tagged animals in each of the five samples. She computes the sample mean of these measurements to find that x bar equals 2.4, and then computes the method of moments estimate for capital N by forming the equation capital N equals lowercase n, or the sample size, times capital K, or the preferred population size, and in this case it's the artificial preferred population size, all divided by the sample mean she just computed. That results in the computation 40 times 150 divided by 2.4, which is equal to 2,500. Thus, she concludes that there are approximately 2,500 moose in the region. In general practice, parameter estimation is performed on data sets that are larger than those which appeared in the previous examples. Moreover, some effort is put into assessing the accuracy of the estimates. Our next example illustrates how that works by revisiting the tularemia example that we've sometimes seen as we've built up our study of probability and statistics. As already stated, in order to model our data collection with the hypergeometric distribution, we will need to estimate the parameters capital N and K. N represents the total population being sampled from, and K represents the number of infected rabbits in the total population. Lowercase n equals 30 represents the sample size, and X represents the number of infected rabbits in the sample. Capital N and capital K are both unknown, so we'll estimate both parameters. And it's best not to estimate both of these parameters simultaneously. So we will first employ a mark and recapture technique to estimate capital N. Once capital N is known, we'll estimate K with the tularemia data. In order to employ mark and recapture, we capture a group of K sub 0 equals 100 rabbits, tag one of their ears, and then re-release them into the habitat. After they've had a chance to redistribute themselves, we capture eight samples of 30 rabbits and count the number of tagged rabbits in each one. The resulting data set is D equals 3024-1142. This data ought to be distributed according to a hypergeometric distribution with the unknown total population of N, the tagged subcategory of k equals k sub 0, which is equal to 100, and then a sample size of lowercase n equal 30. Therefore, the method of moments tells us to set up the first moment equation, or x bar equals mu, which in turn equals lowercase n times k sub 0 divided by capital N. And since we know that x bar equals 2.1250, we can rearrange our formula to show that capital N equals lowercase n times k sub 0 divided by x bar, which results in a value that rounds to 1,412. Well, now we return to our original tularemia data set in order to estimate k as well. The mean of our original data set is x bar equals 9.525. Once more, the first moment equation is x bar equals mu, which in turn equals lowercase n times k divided by capital N. And when we rearrange this formula for capital K, we obtain the new formula, capital K equals x bar times capital N divided by lowercase n. These are all known quantities, so when we substitute them in, we get a computation of 9.525 times 1,412 divided by 30, and this rounds to approximately 448. So therefore, we may try modeling our data set with a hypergeometric distribution using the estimated parameters of capital N equals 1,412, and capital K equals 448, and then the known parameter, lowercase n equals 30. If we plot the graph of the probability mass function for this theoretical distribution on the same axes as our normalized empirical distribution, we can see that agreement between the two appears to be qualitatively good. Moreover, we can also compute the theoretical values of mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis for this calibration of the hypergeometric distribution and compare them to the values we have already computed for our data set. I've 
placed these results in the following table, but we can see that the empirical and theoretical means are both about 9.5. The empirical and theoretical variances are both about 6.3. The skewnesses are both close to zero because this is a relatively symmetric distribution around its mean. And the kurtosis are close. They're one, the empirical value is, is almost two. The theoretical value is almost three. So that's the only place where there's any noticeable disagreement. But the agreement for the other shape parameters appears to be pretty, pretty good. So agreement between the empirical and theoretical shape parameters is somewhat close. So this further corroborates the idea that our choice of the hypergeometric distribution as a theoretical model for our data and our means for taking measurements is a pretty good one. We'll conclude our study of parameter estimation techniques for now with a look at how it would be applied to one of our continuous probability distributions, the normal distribution. And we'll see that there's really not that much to it. Suppose that D equals X1, X2, all the way up through Xn is a set of independent observations of a normally distributed random variable. Recall that the mean of the normal distribution is equal to its mu parameter, and the variance of the normal distribution is equal to the square of its sigma parameter. Appealing simply to the method of moments, we might conclude that the population mean and the sample variance could serve respectively as estimates for the two parameters. These will also turn out to be the maximum likelihood estimators as well. For sufficiently large n, or sufficiently large data sets, both estimates work reasonably well. However, for smaller n, there turns out to be a problem with the use of the population variance. It turns out that as an estimate for the true variance, the population variance is biased. Moreover, the bias of this estimator can be computed. This is the conclusion of the following theorem. The population variance S squared equals one over N times the sum of the squares of the deviations of each data point from the mean of the data is a biased estimator for the variance of the normal distribution. Moreover, the expected value of that population variance can be computed to be N minus one divided by N times sigma squared, the true variance. Well, our mathematical expectation formula for S squared tells us that as an estimator of sigma squared, S squared is always going to be biased a little low. And we can see that because the coefficient n minus one divided by n will always be a little less than one. Much more importantly than that, that mathematical expectation formula gives us a way of devising an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. So we start with our mathematical expectation of S squared, which again is n minus one divided by n times sigma squared. We'll solve that algebraically for sigma squared by dividing both sides of the equation by n minus one divided by n. That gives us n divided by n minus one times the mathematical expectation of S squared is equal to sigma squared. Because mathematical expectation is a linear operator, we can pull the coefficient of n divided by n minus one into the mathematical expectation. And that tells us that the mathematical expectation of n divided by n minus one times S squared equals sigma squared. In other words, n divided by n minus one times S squared is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared where just S squared is not. Well, that allows us to define a new quantity of lowercase s squared, which is equal to n divided by n minus one times capital S squared. But if we substitute what capital S squared is into that formula, we get n divided by n minus one times one over n times the sum of the squares, the deviations of each data point from the mean of our data set squared. If you look at that carefully, you'll see that there's an n in the numerator and an n in the denominator that cancel. And that just leaves us with s, lowercase s squared is equal to one over n minus one times the sum of the squares of the deviations of each data point from the mean of the data set. Well, that quantity is an unbiased estimator of the variance. And it finally justifies the definition that we posed earlier for the sample variance. 
Therefore, with the normal distribution, we will estimate mu and sigma squared with the sample mean and the sample variance of our data set. It's fairly straightforward to use these estimates. In fact, you'll probably find the work to be pretty similar to computing descriptive statistics of a data set. We'll illustrate that with an example. While assessing the health of a watershed, a stream ecologist collects a random sample of 10 smallmouth bass and measures their lengths. The results in centimeters are given by the following data set. Now he believes that this data is normally distributed and wants to estimate the mean and the variance. He does so by computing the sample mean and the sample variance of this data set, and by formula those turn out to be 19.3543 and 2.3551 respectively. So in summary, what this is really telling us now is that the stream ecologist believes that his smallmouth bass length measurements are distributed according to a normal distribution with a mean of 19.3543 and a variance of 2.3551. He might want to convert that variance to a standard deviation by taking its square root, but he's basically calibrated this normal distribution at this point. That brings us to the end of this video lesson. Thank you for watching and I hope you found it helpful. Hopefully you'll join us again on our next video lesson.